writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Hello, welcome to Right Pack Radio. I'm David Allen Lucas, your host, author of Mystery, Science Fiction, Poetry, Horror. And today we're going to talk with Right Pack about persevering, being the persevering writer. With me today, my co-host... Hello, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write gay romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita for Less Than Three Press. Fedora Amos, president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime and writer of humorous Victorian whodunits. My Jack the Ripper in St. Louis will take you back to 1897 St. Louis, assuming you want to go there. And I'm T.W. Finley. I write historical fantasy and science fiction. And my second audio book has just come out. It's a short story by the name of Solar Lullaby, just in time for the solar maximum. Congratulations. I'm Brad R. Cook, author, publisher, and president of St. Louis Writers Guild. Um, publishing company is uh, Blank Slate Press. We are open, so if you've got anything literary, send it our way. And my novel, Iron Horseman, will be out in November. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I write YA fantasy and illustrate children's books, book covers, promotional materials, you name it, I got it. I'm Matt McGraw. Uh, I'm an amateur writer. I write short stories mostly with kind of a fantasy, sci-fi bend, but other things as well. And uh, I'm working on a book called Patrick the Spider with my cousin Jen. Is it a children's book? It's a not-for-children's book. It's <laughs> totally for children. <laughs> <laughs> you should definitely give it to them. <laughs> that was really sinister. <laughs> I'm Jamie Pickover, and I write middle grade and young adult science fiction and fantasy. I'm Melanie Quinney, and I write sci-fi fantasy. Excellent. So perseverance. Why do we even bother writing? If anybody actually looked at writing, they would throw us all into some type of insane asylum because really... There is a lot you have got to survive to get anything published. Hmm. Unless you're self-publishing. And then if you're really doing it intelligently, you have a lot to survive to get through the process. I constantly tell other writers a humorous quote from, a, from my grandmother. Actually, she gave my father a plaque that said this. And I talk about in regards to what we have to go through and the crea- creative process. And as, don't worry if you work hard and your rewards are few, remember, the mighty oak was once a nut like you. (laughs) And it's very true. Are you calling me nuts? Jamie, (laughs) you are nuts, but I still love you. (laughs) I believe you hear voices in your head and you write down what they say. Something must be wrong. Don't we all? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) We own the asylum. (laughs) Ben Bova, who's a science fiction writer, compared writing a novel to laying siege to a city in ancient times. I would say that laying siege to a city is easier. So what does it mean to be perse- to persevere? What is, and what have you had to persevere through? Well, I have a definition. We'll start with a definition. How about that? Um, it's steady persistence in the course of action, a purpose, especially in spite of difficulties, obstacles, or discouragement. And to give you a quote from Thomas Edison, he said, Many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. And I would say, you know, that's that's probably true. Uh, I'll give you an example from my writing. Um, I write short stories, and I've written those for a long time, and so I, I keep trying to get them published. You know, it's, it's one of those things we do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I send them out to contests or, you know, to anthologies. I'm, I'm on Duotrope and Query Tracker and things like that so that I can keep track of all the places I've sent them because I've sent them a lot of different places trying to find a home. And um, I got pretty frustrated with one. It's, it's not in publication right now, but uh, I, I was really getting frustrated because it had won some awards. It had won an award from um, L. Ron Hubbard. He does oh. a, a quarterly uh, science fiction and fantasy contest, which is pretty well known. And so it had gotten honorable mention. I thought, well, why can't this puppy sell, you know? And so I think I had turned that one around. I wrote, rewrote it a little bit, said, okay, let's try it again. And uh, so I, was, I said, well, maybe I just not got the right genre. And because I saw a friend of mine had written a story that was horror, and it didn't look like it was horror to me. I thought it was fantasy. I said, well, if that's horror, then maybe mine is horror. So I turned it around. I sent it off to Writer's Digest, and it came in third. 
So, I mean, it's just like one of those things that you're going, well, how can this be? You know, that you think you know what you write and you, you keep sending it out and you keep knocking your head against the wall and, and yet, you know, you change the genre or change some little something and it works. But it's still not sold. So, <laughs> so there you go. Subject, Persevering. Creature. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad that you mentioned Edison because he was one persevering dude, let he me tell was. you. He, of course, developed the electric light bulb, which I'm sure everybody knows. Well, when he just got it finalized, finished, perfected, he invited the press because, of course, he was a big press hound. And told them that they that he had spent 50,000 times, tried 50,000 different materials to make it work. And the press man said, 50,000 times, didn't you get discouraged? He said, no, of course not. I found out 50,000 things that don't work. That's a good way to look at it. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a very hopeful way, yeah. It is. I really hope I don't have to write 50,000 books to find one that works. <laughs> well, I may be dead by then. Well, maybe it counts all the rewrites, you know, each rewrites a different track. Yeah. Even still. still. <laughs> That's so so it's cheap. So then five saying. books. Yeah. It's still. <laughs> one of the things about writing every day, the, in, the imagination, our brains, whatever, however this all comes about, is similar to a muscle. The, the more we write, the stronger we get, the better we get. And it may take a lot to get past anything, get anything into the real world where someone's going to want to read it. And we think we've written something fantastic in our first draft. <coughs> Excuse me as I laugh at myself on that, but it's true. And usually where the real writing comes in is the rewriting, the reworking it. What, what gets you through that? What, what any of you, anybody who wants to speak up on that, what gets you through that process? I actually really love editing, so, and I think it's because I love watching the words transform from something that is just utterly horrible and nobody in their right mind would want to read and then transform into something that's so much better and just seeing that transformation happen on the page. Um, so that, I, I really just like the editing process. I hate the blank page, and which but seems you know, counterintuitive to a writer, but um, mm -hmm. I, I would rather take words that are already there and make them very pretty. Than... I agree with that, except you get to a point, especially when you think the book is ready to be sent out, but it gets rejected. It's like you're reading it, and you know it could be better, because it always could be better, mm -hmm. but you don't know how it could be better. Mm -hmm. True. I, I think that's what makes rejection so tough sometimes is because you don't always know why it's being rejected. Is it Was it sub subjectivity or was it, you know, something that's inherently wrong with your manuscript and sometimes you just have to take a look at it and every once in a while you get a little kernel from somebody that something isn't working and, you know, you have to decide for yourself if that's where you want to take it or if that's going to help you or if that's not the direction you want to take it. And yeah. It's hard to persevere through that, and I think a lot of times I that's where I rely on my critique partners and my writer friends and say, oh my god, I'm going to die, or I don't <laughs> vent about this. But I think getting it out there and just venting is part well, of persevering. I think that definitely one of the things you just said, I want to come back to you with a question in a minute. That applies to everybody, but one of the things you just said is if you want to get through writing in any way, one of the big things is get yourself plugged into the writing community around you. I mean, I, and there's a lot of people who out there who are, how should I say, arrogant in their writing and think that everyone is less than them. But for the most part, most writers are open. I don't care if they're the most well-published to the newest one. They're open and they're supportive of each other. Wait, you mean writers aren't, you know, the solitary lone wolf-esque thing that exists somewhere in you know, the Arctic, and no one ever sees them, except that when a book comes out, well, they, they maybe go on a tour. Well, they're really pounding, pounding away on the proverbial keyboard we're because not, they're behind deadline. Yes. We're not antisocial. <laughs> we have communities. Typewriters. No, no, writers, writers use typewriters that make the uh, clunk, clunk sound when you hit the keys. <laughs> I used one of those. I still do. Um, it is definitely... Now, now the point is, is that writers are antisocial shut-ins who lock themselves away. Every once in a while, though, we need to get out and, and see the light and talk to each other. We're Otherwise, we're afraid there. that we're the only ones there <laughs> experiencing all that. And, it, you know, in reality, we're all going through the same process. I think, right, I think writing takes a certain amount of emotional and mental solitude to kind of yeah. get the words there. And the writing part, no one else can really write stuff down for you and be in your head during that point, but... The rest of writing is very communal, I think. 
Yeah. Like, if, it, if it wasn't for the writing community, I would have quit a long time ago. <laughs> I yeah. think that's yeah. true for a lot of us. <laughs> I know. Or at least the... the it's uh, really valuable for, I think, the craft, too, just to have other people there who can give you feedback, because that can be difficult, getting, like, something usable out of others that you can then take and turn into some, turn into something for your manuscript. And everybody approaches problems differently. In fact, one, way is, one of the things that created the write-back in the first place was Kathleen here started a write-in, then she had to move away, I did. and I kept it going. Because you're awesome. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but thank you. Anyway, um, and all of us, when we gathered together, we all would hit writer's blocks or questions we're dealing with and start tossing out a question to the whole entire group of, hey, how would you tackle whatever? And, of course, some of those conversations really went off a deep end, and they still do, and that's what leads to this radio program. Um, would someone like to explain what exactly a write-in is for our purposes? A write-in is where... A group of writers get together, and literally they're there for one reason. They're there to write. It gets them out of the way from their office, out of their house, away from distractions. That is, that's the idea behind it. <laughs> yeah, the whole <laughs> one reason, I Sometimes don't agree with. Into, yeah. into new distractions. Into yeah. new distractions. <laughs> yeah. into more distractions. We, we gather to write and talk about Star Trek. Yeah, well, yeah there you go. <laughs> we, actually, though, a write-in is writers gathered together to work on their craft and... Sometimes discuss their craft. Yes. Commiserate and... <laughs> we just have to slide like crazy into sci-fi and everything else. Well, I wanted to bring up a, a bit of an anecdote. I have a friend, she writes screenplays. And she spent time alone writing. But we started, yeah, I invited her to our weekly write-in. And we've had a couple other write-ins. And she remarked how she noticed her uh, productivity has increased being surrounded by other writers, even when she's not speaking. There's something about the energy that everyone brings to the table when we're all writers. And we're, even if we all have our headphones on and we're not looking up and, you know, it doesn't matter. We're all in the zone here together, and we can get some work done. Well, I think we're all looking for validation as human beings, and we certainly need it as writers, because often we don't get much of any other kind. But that's one of the reasons why we enter contests, and we join Sisters in Crime, and we join the St. Louis Writers Guild, mm -hmm. and we also send off those query letters, no matter how we feel about it. And then when we get rejections, the first ones are going to be just no thanks, or it doesn't belong in our line. But then you'll start getting better ones as you keep sending more. By better ones, you mean better rejections. Yes, better <laughs> rejections. Yes, I, I know that sounds crazy, but in the writing community, there are good rejections. Yes. And that's when you get some validation and some explanation as to why they don't like your stuff. And, well, For as an example. Because <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's just a bad fit. I talked to an agent and uh, showed her the first... Ten pages of Jack the Ripper, which she loved. Okay. Oh, send me the next 50, the next 50. I sent her the next 50. Those she did not love. However, I kept on making it better, and eventually they get it published. And one of the things, too, let's talk about the publishing process. As torturous as it can be, but let's be honest. Unless you actually are face-to-face -face with an agent, usually when you submit your work, it's going to their proverbial intern. Somebody who is working for them, not necessarily with pay, and probably still in college. Wellesley. Or, or, or even They're younger Wellesley. in some cases. Or even younger in some Slave cases. <laughs> yes. And what, servitude, thank you. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so you got to get past them first. Then, you go, then if you can get past them, congratulations. Now the agent's looking at it. And the agent and the and even the intern really doesn't want to have a question about what you're writing. They want it in front of them. They want it clean. They want it understandable. If they've got a question on it, they're going to put it aside because they don't have time for those questions. They're reading manuscripts like crazy. I look at Brad and I thirty thousand a year the average agent gets. The average 30? New York agent. How many Is books? That that, queries how many? or queries? Manus okay, I was gonna say that's not a manuscript. No, no, no. Thirty thousand <laughs> queries a year is the average for a, for a New York agent. Are they so, read all? No. As a writer, mm -hmm. as a writer, thirty thousand. Okay, as a writer, pretending that those thirty thousand equal a chapter each. In some cases, considering how many pages might be with them, I'm going for average. Average what was five. Say? Five to ten pages. Yeah, five yeah. to ten pages is pretty average. So let's cut that in half. Say 15,000 chapters. How many chapters do you read out of any book in a year 
Nowhere near that. <laughs> Nowhere near that. <laughs> less than. But much less. Math. So you've got only a couple of seconds to really catch the agent's attention. And the agent's going to reject based on their business. They're not rejecting you. There are so many writers out there who are, I'm going to call them, I'm sorry, man, I don't mean to use this term because you call yourself an amateur mm-hmm. writer. I don't look at you as an amateur writer. Oh. Um, <laughs> we so, have to amend so your intro. I definitely don't get paid. But. Understand, <laughs> what I, understand what I say. That doesn't matter. I, but no. What I'm saying is amateurs are brand new writers who get a rejection, take it personally. And as a rejection of them is really a rejection of their work. And that doesn't mean that your next work won't catch their attention. That agent might be facing deadlines of their own. They ha- may have publishers who are looking for the next Hunger Games or the next Harry Potter. Or for a while they were looking for, what was it, um, mermaid stories. And you didn't write a mermaid story. You wrote a spider story or whatever. Mm-hmm. So you didn't fit in. Which I wanted you to. Well, I just uh, I actually just spoke to uh, the Southeast Missouri Writers Guild yesterday about this. About pitching, and part of that is about rejection. And you're right in the sense that rejection is never about the writer. And to classify an amateur writer, the minute you put uh, pen to paper, the minute you start typing on the keys, you're a writer. Um, whatever level you want to break out from that, if you want to call them professionals or whatever, it, you're still a writer. The problem is, is there's some very unprofessional writers, yes. um, and and they're the ones who tend to get aggro and go yeah. chase down agents and stuff. But the point is is that rejection is actually never about the writer unless you've done something completely unprofessional. It's always about the work. As David was saying, uh, it's all about what they're looking for. They know what all the editors of the big houses are searching for, and every publisher has kind of a wish list. So then they go out, they dig through their slush piles, they go to conferences, and they, they look for those particular novels that they know are going to sell, that they know someone is looking for, that they know have an avenue. If you fit that, that's a match made in heaven. If you don't fit that, you're going to get rejected. But luckily, we live in an age where you can self-publish, you can go to small presses, you can go somewhere else. So. In the term self-publishing meaning... But there's always someone else. To. Yeah, there's always someone else. And that's perseverance. Because <laughs> <Yep. laughs> there's always another agent. Yeah. And if there's not another agent, there's another publisher. And if there's not another publisher... And there's somebody who's going to help you publish that book. Thank you so much for pointing out that amateur comments. Because I've been thinking this every time and then I never actually go into it. An amateur is someone who loves something, who does something out of love for it, whether or not they're good at it. And whether being, or not they're being paid for it. Exactly. And that's well, an awesome thing. Who cares if you know, you're being paid for it? You're writing out of love. And an unprofessional writer may or may not be an amateur writer. It doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. They're completely different. You are awesome for being an amateur. But yeah, and to that end, I mean, a writer is a writer. Somebody who, who composes words together to form sentences and put them in together and do something with that, you're a writer. I don't care if you're five or if you're 95, you're a writer. Back, you know, and back to the rejection a little bit, it's, you know, it is hard for it to not feel personal because your writing is an extension of who you are, but... In the same respect, you have to think about it as a, you know, as a writer, hopefully you're a reader too, and, you know, how many books can you honestly say that you read and you would want to read again, and over and over and over again, and that's what agents have to do when they pick up projects, that's what publishers have to do when they pick up projects, they have to want to read it over and over and over again, just like you have to read your work over and over and over again, so you have to go out and find that person that wants to read your work over and over and over again, and keep persevering to that point, and... You know, the person that keeps persevering and that writer then becomes the author. It's the person who didn't quit. First of all, I love that terminology that you just used. Is of a, that you, not only the editor, the agent, and you have to constantly reread your work and have to fall in love with it to that point, but you're willing to reread that work. I can't tell you the number of books. I've got, I've got a bookstore myself, technically. I don't sell books, but I mean, if you were walking and see all the books I've got, you would swear the books were. Yeah, Maybe I got a library. <laughs> but yet, big. how many of those books have I gone back and reread? Not that many. Very few. I just like to hoard my books. <laughs> but let me come back to a question I said earlier. I had a question for Jamie and Roy's for everybody. And Jamie, you just kind of brought it back You're to the circle. you me on the spot. <laughs> no, not so much. I don't, it's, but it's off of what you said. You love to edit. When does editing get to the point where it's like, okay, I'm done. I can't look at this anymore. I need to send it out. Or I'm done. Is this, this sucks, and I'm going to put it in some proverbial desk drawer somewhere. I, I think when I start wavering back and forth, like, should I change this, and then I change it, and then I 
end up putting it right back where it was. And, you know, I think you hit that point where you're like, you just don't know what else to do with it. And, you know, people don't have any more constructive criticism for you. And you, you just hit that point where you're like, you just feel like you're moving words around for the sake of moving words around. Um, and I know for a while, for me, I was like, well, how do you know when you get to that point? You trust me, you get to that point, you just <laughs> are sick of looking at it. And sometimes you just need to take a break. Yes, I've, uh, I'm similar that I really like revising. It's therapeutic for me to revise. So I've been stuck in the revising phase for far too long on several projects. The, the time to put it down and start something new is when you no longer can take constructive criticism because it's, it's not like, it, it seems like changing it is all you ever do. You're no longer writing it. And it hurts to know that you'll always get constructive criticism because you want it to be done so bad it makes you want to cry. You, you love it. You want it to be the best it can be, but you're not gonna, it, you, you, it feels so real. And yet you're so far from being done. That's when you need to let it simmer for a while and think of something else. And that's exactly the point I was going to make is about sometimes you, you have to get a lot of distance, a mm -hmm. lot of distance. You know, it, it, I always call it fresh eyes. You know, you have to be able to get, get it to where you can actually read it like you didn't write it. Mm -hmm. And that is, doesn't come easily, you know. And I find one of the tricks I have to do on myself is one of the reasons I'm doing these audio books, which I think I told you about for Dora, is I will keep on editing till the dogs come home, you know. Yeah. And at some point I have to say it's really finished. And I, I know that you can have something out there that's published and then you can go back and change it. But if I have something out there that's published, I'm a lot less likely to consider it still eligible for editing. And uh, so I'll move on. And so I'll get a pretty cover from Jennifer yeah. and I'll get some nice editing from my critique group. And, you know, I'll let it simmer. I'll come back to it, you know, once or twice and until I'm, I'm just sick of it. <laughs> and then then at some point, it's got you. Just got to say it's done and move on. But it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's hard to come to that point, yeah. and it's hard to let yourself when you enjoy editing, when you enjoy revising. Yeah. It's hard to let yourself get well, to that point. The perseverance doesn't really end there either, because technically, you've gone through all this process. You've now edited like crazy. You've edited a hundred times over. You've had other people edit it for right. you. Mm -hmm. Then you hand it off to a publisher, and they have an editor, and they give you several pages of editing notes that crush your soul. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can it's, write stat a lot. <laughs> it's, it's an iterative process, and even before you get to a publisher, you may get, you get feedback from your critique group, you get feedback from an agent. You know, you have to decide when you get that feedback what works for you, what doesn't, and, you know, fix it to the best of your ability and then send it back out in the world. And, you know, then, like you said, when it gets to a publisher, you're going to have to... That's a Got good point, again. actually. Yeah. Your agent's first going to give you editing, several yeah. pages of editing notes. You're going to do all those editing notes. Then you're going to hand it off to the publisher. They're going to give you more editing notes. Now, here's a question. How do you determine what editing advice to take? So if it's your publisher... If it's your publisher and your agent, I mean, take it and run. Change it, make the changes, almost, say thank you, and keep going. Usually that's true. I've actually heard of one author, he actually had, a, you know, he was a university professor, so he could afford to do this, but he actually walked away from a publishing deal because they, he felt like they wanted a different book than what he had written, and he got it published by a different publisher, much more like he wanted it, not that he wasn't willing to make changes, he didn't like their changes. Mm -hmm. But, for example, I took a writing workshop, workshop to story, got great constructive criticism, made a bunch of edits. I took another writing workshop, submitted the same story again. By the way, this was perfectly allowable. And I got comments that were pretty much, some of the comments, they never had seen the first version, but they were saying like, okay, put it back the way it was originally. <laughs> mm -hmm. On that note, um, I feel like they're, well, getting critiqued, having your story critiqued, I should say, because your story is not you, everyone. Um, having a story critique can be kind of nerve wracking. And even if the critiques are spot on, like they, they point out something that you could not figure out what was wrong, but that's the thing and you feel all excited and happy about it, it's still gonna sting a little. But I think that the, um, the feedback you get that feels right for the story, like, ah, oh, that's what it was. I couldn't, I couldn't pinpoint it, but that's what it was. Um, that's what you take. The other stuff, eh, you kind of yeah. weigh it a little better. Well, I think that brings up a good point too. When you get feedback, my initial reaction is just to go crazy and scream and get angry, and and then you have to take a step back and let it simmer. I think for a little bit, and then you can kind of go, okay, 
I still feel like this person is crazy and they don't know what they're talking about. Or more often than not, I find that, hey, they bring up a really good point and maybe I should look at this. And you can always give something a try, see how it works out. And if you don't like it, go back to where you were before. You're no better, you know, worse off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like someone said that my kid should not have, you know, someone said my kid's not worthy of, you know, entering this pageant or whatever. And you're like, you're an awful person. My child is beautiful. And then you're like, oh, well, they were right about the clothes, though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you try again. Not necessarily with toddlers and tiaras asks things, but, you know. <laughs> but I, I think if you hear it from more than one source, yeah. you know, that, that yeah. often is an indication that, you know, it may be something you need to look at. But then again, maybe you're in the wrong genre. Maybe you're could submitting be. it to the wrong publisher, yeah, the wrong be. agent. Well, yeah. and that's one thing, too, I was going to say is everybody who you run into when they read your book, whether they absolutely love it or rip you a new one, if you will, with all the editing and the crushing and that we've talked about, Opinions are like what we sit on. Okay, <laughs> there's actually a more or less there's a more colorful version of this, but mm-hmm. opinions are like you, what we sit on. Everyone's got one; they all stink. Mm-hmm. The choice is which ones do you go with? And Teresa, what you said is a fantastic thing. If you're hearing this from more than one person, that that there's that smoke, there's fire. There there should be something telling you. Wait a minute, maybe I'm not seeing this. And we've talked a lot about traditional publishing. I'm going to go into self-publishing. I'm not self-published, but I'm going to go into this just for a moment. Brad talked about the destruction of your soul, actually talked about the crushing of your soul, by all these edits. In my work life, in my pay-the-bill job, there's a lot of writing I have to do that it will put anybody who's listening to this program asleep. But I cannot catch my mistakes. I can, maybe months later, catch some of them, but not... At the time in which I'm under deadline and so forth. I know in the self-publishing world, there's this big push that, no, you should be your own editor or your critique partner should be your editor. In all honesty, my opinion only, so remember what I said about opinions, but my opinion only is you need a jaundiced eye to look at your work before you take it to publishing, be it as a self-publisher or if you're going to send it off to an agent. Because your critique partner has seen that work how many times? Don't answer that question, just... In your head, how many times, if you've got a good critique partner, have they seen that? They can no longer see the errors. They're looking for what they think should be there. Take it to somebody who has never looked at it, preferably a professional editor of some kind. Hey, if you're willing to put the book out yourself, you better be willing to put the money out there for it and get it edited. I would like to bring it back to um, writing, perseverance in writing. Not necessarily publishing, because I feel like those are a bit different, and we've been straying into the publishing section. Um, A writer is someone who writes. That's a quote that I've heard. Um, And I wanted to know how you guys feel about, you know, writing schedules. Do you write every day? Do you wait for inspiration? And how does it feel if you're not writing and you want to be writing? How do you go through that? Like, are you not not a writer anymore? What's wrong with you? Okay. Uh, To answer that question... Uh, I have two things to say. One is my own personal opinion, and then the other one I'm going to bring up in New York Times, best-selling author. So we just talked to Angie Fox about this, Mm -hmm. and she agreed, actually with my personal belief, um, that when you show up every day and you write every day, whether that's the same time every day or where, you know, but when you go to that desk, your muse is going to be there with you. It may not be every day that the muse is there and that you're going to flow, but you have a better chance of getting something on the page and persevering. The other point to that is that there's the, uh, I think it's the Steinbeck quote, that if you write every day in 400 days, if you write a page a day in 400 days, you'll have a novel. So there's that aspect of it too. The only way to finish a novel is to write regularly. So to answer that. So how do people feel about, you know, writing is not a, uh, a sprint. I was a sprinter. Writing is not a sprint. It is. It's a marathon. It is. <laughs> oh my goodness. So well, That's why I use Ben Bova's quote a lot of comparing it to a siege of a, of a city but slightly less exhausting mm, well actually no. I'd say more no. <laughs> I'd say sieging, I, I'm still a sieging a city is easier it's got yeah. less. is it because you got other people partly <laughs> <laughs> partly you've got an entire you've army with you you know what to do you got weapons and it's, usually you know, when the townspeople have surrendered you know you're done Whereas when you're sending off a book to... Yeah, Canada, you're not you're, done. You're not done. Even when you're done with the book, you're still not done. Right. Even when you're done, done with the book and on to the next book, you're still not done. done. Are you done, done, done? I'm done, done. <laughs> but I've got something before you go into that next part. Kind of answering your previous question. 
as everybody here knows, I've talked about where I've had to have a change in the way I do things because, hey, and this is something else I want to talk about, persevering through outside life, interfering with your writing life. It is tough. And I've had to go from my old, my old discipline was literally wake up at around 4 o'clock in the morning, sometimes earlier, write for a couple hours before I had to go to work, then come home after work and write unless I had something that was pressing to do outside of that. And that was how I, and I did 12 plus practice novels. I'm not a short story writer. My, my, my experience comes from the hard way, doing the novel. And now I'm back to trying to find what that rhythm is. Yes, I'm finally able to get back to writing on a daily basis. And I know that sounds really bad. A lot of writers out there are probably going, you should always write daily. You always should write daily. It's not about writing daily. There's nothing wrong with scheduling time Uh to write a book. I mean, I know in the chunks of the year Uh when I have the most time to actually sit down every day and write that book. It's It's not about necessarily sitting down 365 days a year. It's about showing up when you're in the process of actually writing that book and getting it all out. And being able to that. block away everything that's trying to interrupt you at the time. Yeah. And sometimes that just does not happen. I hate, and I'm, I'm speaking of the reality I live through. It does not always happen. But there you're writing most days of the week, aren't you? I'm right. Well, or I am back to that. Begin, yeah. yeah. It's Your always in the mind. Doing, it's always yeah. in the mind. And that's something we talked about on another show is we are never off work. We're always writing. Yeah, writing's a 24-hour-a-day job. Exactly. Well, if there's anybody out there who's thinking about writing and you, know, you just haven't decided to get into it or, you, oh, I think I'm going to be a writer when I retire and I've got time to write. Actually, that's not a bad time. It's not a bad time. You're <laughs> busy then, too. Yeah, you're busy you then, too. But as someone once said, writers, this is the only profession where you do not have vacation or sick time. You are constantly writing. Well, we had the good fortune to have Chuck Sambuccino um, let us use one of his articles in The Scribe, which is the uh, St. Louis Writer Skills uh, quarterly magazine. And it was about keep moving forward, which is perfect for this topic. And, yes. and he was talking about it's not just your, your writing, like we're talking about here, your, your writing of your actual work, but your writing goals overall. And, uh, you know, that can be anything from how many queries you send out to your marketing to uh, the contest you enter, any sort of thing. It's all related to your writing. And his thing is, you know, just just keep going forward. You're going to get rejections. You're going to, to have these roadblocks. And, you know, just don't stop there. Don't let it stop you. You just keep sending things out. No matter how close to quitting you are. I was just going to agree with that and say that... Um... With, with the keep moving forward, I'm one of those writers that I can't sit down and put words on the page every single day. I don't have time for it, and it hurts my brain to do that. But like David said, it, the, the brain never shuts off. It's always working, and even if I'm not consciously thinking about it, there's stuff going on in the background, and I am writing even when I'm not writing. You know, I'm world building, I'm outlining, I'm sending queries, I'm, you know, doing any number of things that writers do, so... It, even if you're not physically sitting at the computer and typing words and adding to the story, your brain is still thinking about it. And I think that's what's important. And when you do actually sit down to write those words, like Brad said, that you are present and that you're actively working towards getting more words on the page. And before I let Jennifer go just real fast, because you made me think of something that Brad talked about a couple of episodes ago. He has a shoebox of some kind where he's put, tossed in as ideas. A lot of times when we come up with ideas, or a lot of times when we're trying to find time to write, we'll come up, we'll write down ideas. Trick is holding on to them and putting them somewhere, be it in an application or a shoebox or something. Go ahead, Jen. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to encourage writers. I find it, we're talking about perseverance. Yes. I find it hard to persevere surrounded by a lot of, you should do this, you should do that, don't count on this, don't count on that. Being published is a dream few people achieve. Get used to rejection. Get, get used to seeing your star dwindle. I find it hard to persevere through that. If you're a writer and you write once a month, congratulations. You're a writer. If oh, writing yeah. makes you feel good, yes. then you write. If it's not something that you do every single day because you don't feel like it, don't sit down and make yourself work. You know, Take time out of the rest of your life that... You're living to feel like if I don't write every day, I'm not a writer. You're a writer if you want to write. That's the point. And it's if you want to get published after that, you're allowed to try and get published after that, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing I'm going to add to what Jen's saying. 
whenever one one of the fun things about being a writer is we never stop learning our craft. And that can happen by picking up some best selling book off of a shelf, reading a classic, or reading a book on writing, or a magazine on writing. Reading or, a really bad book. Or, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, actually, you learn a lot from bad books. I learn a lot, a lot more, more by reading bad books. reading bad books mm-hmm. and learning from them. So that's something else, too. Just because maybe you can't touch a book for, or, or write and touch your work for a month or so, or just mentally or physically can't, there's always a chance to read other books and never stop dreaming. We have brought up just now the uh, books on writing and everything. I'm a total systems junkie, total systems junkie, because whenever I find something that works for me, it stops working. (laughs) Like, so I inhale books on writing, books on other writers and how they do what they do. And there is a lot of advice in those. And I think the key is if it appeals to you, if you might, if you think it might work, you can try it out, but don't let other people's shoulds should on your dreams and your writing. It's just not worth it. You gotta find what works for you and then, you know, keep working on with, with that and realize that every book is gonna be different and because yeah. every person is different. Well, yeah. that's, a, that's another thing that writing workshops can get you either just like a Saturday or an actual like class, either in college, community college, whatever, because you go through a lot of, you learn a lot of those techniques and some of them might not work for you at all and be a pain to do, and some of them might just really speak to you, mm-hmm. or speak to you sometimes. You should always do what works for you. Uh-huh. Yeah. And the point of writing every day, it's not about literally sitting down and writing every day. I mean, that's how you finish a book, a novel, I should say. But it's, you know, as we said, writers are writers because they write. If you're writing, you're a writer. It doesn't matter how often you do it. It doesn't matter if you're doing it once a week, once a month, or once a year. It's really just a question of, at once a year, when's that book actually going to get finished? <laughs> um, Octavia E. Butler, who is an amazing, amazing yes. sci-fi writer, um, has an essay called Fuhrer Scribendi in her book Blood Child and Other Stories, of short stories. And um, that essay is all about, you know, it pushes persistence, persist. That is the main point. Um, establishing a writing habit is going to get you a lot farther, she says, than... Um, just waiting for inspiration to strike. Yeah. You need a habit. And I think that's why people say write every day. It's not necessarily going to work for everyone, but having a habit of some kind is helpful. Well, we touched on this in Amusing the Muse. You know, that the you know, if you're waiting for your muse to sing, you could be waiting a really long time. But if you show up with your muse every single day with the guitar and all the instruments ready to go, you got a better shot that she's gonna pick it up and start, you know, playing along with you. <laughs> I, I have a friend who says that uh, she doesn't. She's a real professional writer, and she says oh. if her muse doesn't show up, what she does is grab that ugly bee yep. and take her in and <laughs> shove her on top of her computer and say, "Do your thing." And if you're if you're in a writing habit, it, that inspiration is going to strike more frequently, I think, because your brain is already working on it and continuing on. As, as David said, like a muscle. You keep on working it. Um, about writing books, there are a lot that will tell you all kinds of things. And there are a lot that are talking about um, how to be a productive writer, even though you have no time at all, because you, you know, work three jobs and also don't sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, And those will talk. There's all your time right there when you don't Mm -hmm. sleep. (laughs) But you're you're not sleeping because of the jobs, though. I sleep. Sleep sleep writing. That's my problem. That would be awesome. Sleep writing. Have your notebook by your bed. Your um, subconscious. Exactly. And let it tell you what you should write the next day. I got like five, six hours a night. I could be sleep writing. (laughs) Just leave your hands on the keyboard. (laughs) (laughs) When you wake up. No, no, no. I've already had that. And then you have to go delete like a thousand (laughs) GHs and stuff. You know? It's not fun. So that doesn't work. Like studying through osmosis does. No, it didn't like, quite work the same way. With a notebook by your bed. You can have these weird key indentations on your forehead. Thing going through my head of all work and no play makes Jackie a dull boy. 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 On that note, <laughs> go ahead. Um, when people talk about being a productive writer or you know all work and no play, you mm-hmm. need that balance as a writer. What kind of writing do you guys ever get the feeling that like, oh, I didn't write on such and such story today, so. Just because I wrote a lot of dreck that was about what was in my head, I didn't actually officially do my writing today. Oh, no. That does, the, the, if you're writing something that counts, unless you have a specific deadline for that particular novel, yeah. that's different. Deadlines are great motivators. Though. They are yeah. great motivators. But you could be writing a blog post. You could be, you know, you could be world building. You could be, I mean, you could be doing any number of things that would be writing. See, I'm on the other side. 
I get I give myself guilt trips. Me too. That if I if I did not write on a certain project, then I don't care what I wrote elsewise. Like I could have written a blog post, I could have written poetry or whatever. I feel like I have stumbled that day. I am the same way, which is why I brought it up. I will tell this to um I will completely disagree with this for anyone but me <laughs> anyone else it's fine with it if it's me oh i didn't do enough i didn't do enough i'm a terrible person part of being a writer is being able to play do any of you guys like well now you're hitting on self-doubt and self-doubt is the a number one killer of writers out there and, and i mean that literally as in we all die some little death out there if we listen to that voice of self-doubt. How do you persist through it? But That's a really good question. Motivator. And guilt is a great motivator. For some people. Therapy can be another, <laughs> you know. Yeah, no, I, um, I think little wins are really important. Little wins are good. And you know, Jennifer had a, a great little win the other day. It was very inspiring to hmm. me when uh, she, she got a hard copy uh, of her book published for her. Yeah, a my print, unpublished... Yeah, talk about my, that, my, Jennifer. My, unpublished official first final draft it yeah. was a promotion through lulu which is an online uh self-publishing website um it, so they do sell books on there but mm -hmm. it's largely for people to print off their own copies and, and this sell is a themselves proof copy so this was a proof hardback yeah and, and you can get proofs on like create space too and mm -hmm. maybe just holding that thing in your hand until you can actually Get to the point where yeah. it really is ready. I mean, that give that little, little yes. win. Something to something, something, so something you know show people and yes. say, yeah. mine. If you yeah. can get a cover, you'll have the same a feeling. Cover. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, in terms of like persevering through uh, self doubt, or even, I guess, through like uh, editing and any other kind of you know issues you may have, I think what a the strong motivation at the core of things is love. Not even passion, really. Like passion, passion could fail. I think love is more. Uh, it's steady, long term. You have to love your story, love your characters, know them, and uh, that'll steer you right through uh, editing. It'll give you that gumption you need to get through to the end of any long, tortuous process because you love them and you you want them to you want to see the story succeed. Mm -hmm. I think the other good motivator for me is talking about my writing out loud to others, whether I'm stuck or it. it Sometimes just hearing this, hearing it come out of my mouth and not even having anyone respond to me helps me get unstuck. Or hearing somebody say, that's a really cool idea, where are you headed with that? Or having, even just having somebody take interest, they don't even have to say that's cool, just asking one question to me then says, oh, well, they're, they're thinking about my writing, and then that gives me energy to want to dive in there and answer those questions and keep going. So I was going to bring up process. Um, because Matt, you brought up love and how that is a steadier way of going often than passion, which can flare up and die down. Um, I'm thinking that product versus process, for me, it interferes a lot with writing. Like if I'm focused too much on what I could produce out of what I'm doing now that could possibly be published or possibly, you know, gain me love or all those other little, little subconscious reasons you have for doing anything that you don't necessarily recognize, when that becomes the driving force of what you're doing, or at least what's pushing you the most and what's weighing on your mind the most, the so you process need to of writing is you harder. Need, you need to focus on the journey, not the destination. Yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Uh, one of the things about persevering in this business is, irregardless of how many books you can put out there, or short stories, poems, Whatever it is that you write, it is being able to enjoy this journey because part of this journey, we sacrifice a lot. We really do. There's things in which other people, they go on vacation. They actually get to go on vacation. Our brains don't. Our stories are there. We are sitting in at our proverbial laptops or however we write, and the family may be having a family reunion or a barbecue, and you have got a deadline. You've got to fit. you got to meet. We sacrifice a lot. But, we, but to make it through this, we have to persevere. And we have to make it as a writer. And you better, whether that you like the journey itself or not, and what some stumbling blocks you go through, you have to survive it. And you have to love the fact that you are constantly on a journey of change. All right. So um, persistence in writing, it sounds then like there are three things that help the most in keeping up with writing, even when it's hard. You need support, community, which that's what all of us are doing kind of right now. 
which is why I love a right back. You need um, habit or some kind of understanding of how you work best so that you can keep up with that even when it's extremely hard and you don't want to. So you have some way of not necessarily getting in your own way. And lastly and most important, I think, is love. Remembering why being an amateur is what started you writing in the first place. I cannot go back to that enough. You loved it enough to start. So even when it's hard, you know that there was something there that you can't see right now. You lost it because you're frustrated. You're in the muddy middles, whatever. But it's worth going forward for. And nothing is ever easy. You know, like when you first learned, learned how to add or multiply or whatever, there was a struggle there. So you have to struggle to keep moving forward. Thank you. And thank you to the audience for listening to Right Back Radio. And tune in next week for yet another topic. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Right Pack Radio would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their office. STL Books is an online bookstore specializing in new and used high-quality literature, children's books, and books written by or about St. Louis. Please visit them online at www.stlbooks.com or find their store on the Amazon.com website.